Nice timing. It's as if we coordinated that somehow behind the scenes. <laughs> Hello, Pamela. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Good. It is outrageously hot here on the west coast of Canada. Like it is not here. 31 degrees. We are breaking records. It is not right this early. We should be having still rain this early in June every now and then. <clears throat> no, we've got July, August weather already. Oh, man, we're in the yeah. low 20s. Oh, really? Yeah. I, that'd be nice. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's it's crazy. It's crazy. It's it's completely insane. Breaking records, watering the garden all the time. Yeah. So we're living on the, on the rainy side of this uh, continent. We have four baby groundhogs instead of a garden. Aw. They, they're, right. They're very cute, but... but they would they, eat your garden. Yeah, they preclude tomatoes. So as promised, we've uh, we've exited our famous experiments and we've moved on to now a random collection of astronomy related stuff. So we're going to have some uh, we're going to have some sort of very solid, you know, science concepts, concepts in astronomy and some mad Fraser Kane fright, flights of fancy um, to to get us through to the uh, to the hiatus, which is in about another three weeks. So awesome. So just to remind everyone, if you have no idea what this random banter is, you have stumbled into a live episode of Astronomy Cast where we're about to record our, uh, our podcast. It's going to take us about half an hour or so to go through this, and then we'll stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy. So, um, right, you can interact with us, and the way to do that is to use the Q&A app. So just go ahead and wherever you're watching this, just click that you're interacting with the audience, and then you'll see a video and some comments already. And just to demonstrate, I'm going to say hello to Tam von Scotter, Tom von Sc Tom Van Scotter, Tony Lynch, Will Idoni, Sylvan Westby, Steve Chisnell, Guido Bibra, Peter Waldman, Nancy Graziano, Richard Clark, ISS Above, Richard Strassel and Thomas Tranecker. Um, Guido Bibra says, hey, has the topic changed twice now from the last experiment show to something with Pluto to limits of optics? Um, it actually only changed once, which was that we had an experiment show and then we decided to switch it to um, point spread, spread functions. Functions. So Pamela's original suggestion was point spread functions. I after I sort of dug out what that meant from her, what it means. I used the science term. I know, I'm I know. sorry. I understand that. I understand that. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm every man. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to try to stand in for everybody. So so I suggested that perhaps what we were going to be talking about was the limits of optics. And uh, and she begrudgingly agreed with me. So I did not begrudge. I simply was amused. <laughs> right. Uh, the fact that I had to Google that. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, and Richard Clark says, hope you have a great summer, everyone. Dr. Pamela, I hope you finally succeed in your apparently never-ending quest for funding and get back to do what you'd love to do. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, it's currently in the hands of the National Science Foundation and NASA. All I can do is wait. Well, I have good news, which is that, um, uh, Hero X, you know, the company that I work for, we were uh, awarded or were part of a bid for NASA to be one of their prize platforms. Cool. Yeah. So us and a whole bunch of people, there was a press release out on the NASA website and there's going to be a bunch of organizations and we'll be trying to run some of their prizes. So yeah, I'm really excited. Um, okay. Let's do a show. I'm ready. I am ready to, I'm pressing record. It's recording. Hi, Preston. Testing, testing. Also recording. All right, let's roll. Astronomy Cast, episode 380, The Limits of Optics. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? 
doing great. Uh, so we don't, I don't, we didn't really queue up anything to talk about, but is there anything new and interesting happening over on CosmoQuest? Anything that people should go and do? Anything, we, anything they should analyze? We are doing a summer of science. We are encouraging everybody to get online, uh, participate in doing a certain amount of science every day. Scholastic summer reading program encourages an hour of reading, will encourage an hour of science, but because reading is also important, we have a blog post up on perfect pairings of science and science fiction. So when you're analyzing the moon, listen, the moon is a harsh mistress. If you're working on Mars, um, the Martian is there for you. So check out our blog for that perfect pairings of audiobooks and science that you can do. That is, that is great. I, uh, <clears throat> I plan to inflict this on the children. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's get rolling then. So astronomers rely on the optics of their instruments, and there are some basic limits that you just can't avoid. Whatever we look at is distorted by the optic. In fact, a basic property of light means it will never get perfect optics. So here's why we can't magnify and enhance forever. So that, that term, right, magnify and enhance, magnify and enhance, that drives you bonkers, doesn't it? It, it's not so much that it drives me bonkers as it's just sort of like, I, I wish I, I that that's a good thought. <laughs> that would be great. I could, <laughs> Nobel, so many Nobel prizes could have right. been achieved. Yeah. It, it's just, I, I will rage against the television during certain spy shows when, when they do the whole, we have an image from outer space and they show the raw image and in the raw image, everything is kind of pixelated and then they do magic. And when they do magic, suddenly you can like read license plates and stuff. And it's just sort of like if, if the raw image had that is two pixels across, it's still two pixels across. So... I guess let's go back to like the spy movie or whatever, right? And you just sort of described this really well. They're, they're, they've got so this kind of grainy, blurry image from really far away and they, they, they zoom in and then someone's zooming in and enhance. They pick some little part and then they, they blow it up and then a computer does some kind of pixel interpolation and, and you get a little bit more uh, resolution and then, no, no, just that area on the license plate and then it zooms in again, you get a little, and then boom, the license plate comes into view and then they've, they've got their lead. Where are they going wrong there? They're going wrong by having a delivery man coming to the door right now. Let me close doors. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know if that's what happens in the science. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to just make a few more comments and then Preston, you're going to have to cut all this out. Uh, so Thomas Tranecker says 45,367 craters marked and you can help Pamela at CosmoQuest. Nicely done, Thomas. Um, Nathaniel uh, Sanchez says it's a hundred degrees right now and we're getting up to 107. Uh, but that's Arizona. Come on, man. That's, that's, that's you chose that place. I chose a, a temperate rainforest. Um, Your temperate rainforest has a lying ecology. Yeah. Uh, and Tom Nathy notes that uh, Kerbal Space Program and Tau Zero. I'm not sure what that was in related to. Tau Zero is Tau a constant. Yeah, but there's also like a Tau Zero society, I think. People are trying to create faster than or exploration of the... Tau is H bar divided by pi or some or H divided by pi. All right, and let's get cracking confused. again. Okay, but, sorry. Uh, do, <laughs> let me, uh, we need to apologize to Preston. Okay, so at, when last we saw our heroes, I can re-ask the question if you like. No, I remember uh, the question. So it's where exactly. are they going wrong? So, so the fundamental issue is you get data with a digital detector um, such that you have little tiny light buckets called pixels that are simply going light or no light. And they do this usually in several thousand different increments of light or no light. Those pixels, you, you can only do so much to figure out, well, if you have light in this pixel and no light in this pixel, what must be going on between these two pixels? And with these spy shows, what they're doing is essentially saying, we have six pixels and we're going to somehow take those six pixels or usually it's something like three by six pixels. And we're going to resolve those three by six pixels into 300 by 60 pixels. And you can't get information out of nothing. It, it's sort of like saying you're 
your text on your your screen is suddenly capable of allowing you to read an entire page of a novel when there's only five pixels by 10 pixels on the page or something. Right, and so if you actually blew up those pixels to the larger resolution, you would just get Bigger five pixels. big big pixels, five big squares, and and you wouldn't get any additional information. So I think I think that's pretty obvious to to most of us. But I think where people are going wrong now is that when they're seeing these these photographs and such of Ceres and Pluto and uh, and then they're starting to kind of hypothesize what we could and couldn't do with our with our current telescopes you know there are not only sort of the capabilities of the instruments but also just basic laws of physics that we can't overcome right and and there are some some deceptions that end up occurring whether we want them to or not so so first of all there's the basic problem that if you open up your picture picture of pluto picture of ceres picture of whatever it is that you took a picture of that is three pixels across, you can blow it up in Photoshop and say, use bicubic interpolation or some other form of interpolation. And it will happily go, okay, so when I make this bigger, the center of this pixel has this value, the center of this pixel has this value. I've made each of those pixels now 20 by 20, and I'm going to do some mathematical smoothing between those two points to make shit up. And, and that's, that's what Photoshop is doing is it's making up a mathematical way of getting from the center of one pixel to the center of another. So people get deceived into the, but that picture I see on space.com is like clearly a hundred pixels across. Well, no, but the image that we got back to earth was three chill. Yeah. Um, we get that a bit with, um, I don't know if you ever have people like finding, uh, creatures on Mars or strange, uh, you know, they think, they think they're seeing buildings and structures on the surface of Mars. And what they're really seeing is artifacts from, from Photoshop attempting to, to scale up things. You scale up what could be a, a tiny little object in the, in the image, and it's going to take on rectangular features because the pixels themselves are rectangular. And, and then the, the next problem that we end up with is, Anytime you look at something through an optical system, it's going to end up getting an artificial blurring, no matter how clear the picture, no matter how perfect the lack of atmosphere you're looking through. And, and this is, sorry, there's a bird trying to get into my office. Um, and this is due to a physical phenomena called the formation of an RE disc. It's, it's what happens when you have light getting focused down to a point. Well, the light getting focused down to a point is going to have a ring around it, which is going to have a ring around it, which is going to have another ring around it. And how small that central point in the RE disk is, is defined by your optical system. And it's always going to be bigger than zero. So if you're looking at a point function that should have like all the light in an absolute tiniest point possible, that tiniest point actually is going to end up getting an artificial size to it due to the interference inherent in light waves. Whoa. Yeah. So, okay. So let's give some practical examples of this, right? Like in actual, like, so let's say we're going to point the Hubble Space Telescope at Pluto and we're going to take a photograph of it. It's going to be itty bitty teeny tiny even on the Hubble Space Telescope's massive optics and this is yes. why all we have are very blurry images of, of of Pluto and so you're saying that the that the the interference the light itself is interfering with itself yep and and is causing i guess uh like a probability function of where it appears in your in your images and that you literally can't see where it actually is and what it actually is because of this interference. It, exactly. Using Hubble as, as an example, it actually complicates the picture even more because when you're dealing with Hubble, now you're dealing with a complicated optic system that is going to add in its own distortions. So even if we had like a, a perfect single lens system, single mirror system that focused the light down onto 
a detector of some sort. And we're looking at a distant star. So, so there is no angular size to what we're looking at. It is a point source. Even that absolute point source looked at through vacuum because of the nature of the collimated light coming off of it. This is where all the light waves get lined up. You're going to end up with the photons interfering with the photons and, and creating this set of rings that creates a disk. And I, I think I, I kind of understand this sort of, you know, I'm thinking about it in my mind, right? Like you can imagine like what a, a lens is, what, what an optic system is, is it's a funnel. And so you're taking the light rays that would be parallel to each other and then you're you're squooshing them down so that more of them are you know a bigger collecting area is falling on a smaller ccd and so it's like you're you're packing the photons together and that and that's causing them to interfere with each other so they're not where they would have normally been they're now in a much tighter area interfering with each other is that is that kind not of right quite it, it's simply the the nature of of lenses and and mirrors when you when you play with the lens you can actually if, if you do this just right you can set up a set of, of rings by pointing a laser through a lens or you can set up a series of lines against a wall if you reflect a laser off of a cd that maybe you got in the mail with something or a dvd you have hanging around in the house light just likes to interfere with itself it doesn't have to be crammed down it simply has to be put in a situation where the where the rays go from traveling parallel to one another to being put in a position where they can interact. So instead of focusing them down, you can, for instance, focus them through a slit. And when you focus them through a slit, they spread outwards. So, so it's any time the light rays are given a chance to go from being parallel to one another to being not parallel to one another, and they can interfere. Right, and you will literally lose information. So how do astronomers, I'm, I'm guessing that when, in a, you know, professional astronomers, they spend some time dealing with learning all of this, and then it's like, it's the uncertainty in their results, right? That as they look at images, they know what the... Uh, what the resolution you know. of the system is going to be. And, and it's actually a good thing that we have this point spread function in a way, because if, if you think about it, if you have the light from a star spread out over a few different pixels, that allows you to to do better analysis on it, to do things like correct for cosmic rays and things like that, that you couldn't do if the light was a square star, if you had that single pixel of light. So when you do have telescopes that have really big pixels and really large fields of view, you do have to sometimes knock them a little bit out of focus to get the starlight spread out over more than one pixel. So it actually works in our favor to have this point spread function. But it's it's different than like when you say you know the the actual CCDs where the the photons will spill out of one bucket and then into others, right? And then your your image actually has gets bigger because there's just too much light falling in any one area. That that's that's where you saturate your image. So, right. so the way to think about a CCD is it's that ultimate set of detectors that are collecting the starlight that's raining down from the sky. And if you get too much starlight in one bucket, it's going to flood out of that bucket. And it has the potential where the buckets touch on the sides and the top to spill from one bucket to another. Now, it turns out the way the optics usually work that you end up with preferential spreading along one axis, which is where you end up with spikes that are often missed termed diffraction spikes. No, they're just saturation spikes. Um, but this is one of the things we have to deal with. Now, it's it's not just the RE disk that ruins your images to a certain point, or in the case of trying to do photometry, makes what you do a little bit more understandable. Um, you also have to worry about the optic systems um, smearing the light that you're looking at in different ways. So, so this is where I said looking at things with the Hubble t Space Telescope is an actually more complicated problem because you end up with the way the light focuses in the center in the image is different from the way the light focuses on the edge of the image. Um, and this is a convolution of optical issues, of tracking issues. Um, here on the ground, sometimes you just have the someone bump their head on the telescope issues. And of course, the atmosphere. And, and the atmosphere, and all of this works against you. And people do try and deal with this by doing fancy deconvolutions, but you can never mathematically say this fancy deconvolution I did is 
actually representative of what the light would have done had you not bumped your head on the telescope, but it's the best you can do. And so each iteration, each each time you move through a piece of optic system, each time you have to go through an instrument, you know, every as you come through the atmosphere, you're going to lose a certain amount of information that can never be restored, that can exactly. never be brought back. And no amount of trying to fill in the gaps is going is to work. And so it just adds uncertainty to uncertainty to uncertainty each step that you go. And you, this, this means that we do have to do complicated things when we're doing our science. For instance, if you're trying to accurately measure the light from stars, you have to take into account the fact that your stars may actually look like teardrops and count the light within a teardrop shaped what we call annulus the the shape where we count the light and say this is starlight and then a teardrop shaped um annulus around that which is where we say this is what the sky's light is to get at that sky subtraction from the star to get a pure star starlight it means that when we're trying to separate stars from galaxies um at the edge of our ability to separate those two, we have to be careful to realize that our stars may be ellipsoids because of tracking issues. And, and so you have to say all ellipsoids that are shaped in this one exact way, that's probably a star. We, we have ways to take this into account, but it does, as you point out, add uncertainty to what we're doing. So how do you as an astronomer when you're you're planning out, for example, you're going to do an observing run, you're trying to get a certain kind of data, how do you account for all of those of those issues? You know, it, do you know, I mean, I guess, when, does an observatory provide you with the various issues along the way, and then you have to then compute the uncertainty into what you're doing? It, it all depends on the system you're using. Uh, so, so for instance, a lot of the research I did where I was dealing with uh, either a wide field uh, telescope uh, that had a one degree field of view, and it was on Earth, and it was dealing with wind, and it was dealing with tracking issues, and all of the things that are fundamental to using a telescope that is as old as I am or older. Um, I knew that every night I had to, for each different image, calculate a new point spread function. I had to figure out for this image, if I look across all the stars in the field, I can mathematically determine the point spread function up here is like this, down here is like this, and it graduates between those two shapes across the field. So it was image by image. If you're dealing with a Hubble Space Telescope, they know the optics-based point spread function. So as long as you're not doing anything weird that might induce some sort of a tracking error because you're looking at a moving object that is moving at a rate that maybe you miscalculated. As long as you're dealing with perfectly normal science, they know the optics of Hubble perfectly and they can tell you this is the point spread function. And you just mathematically build that in and the software does it for you once you figure it out or once you're given it. And so can you come up with a result, but, but because of the, I guess, the limits of the optics along the way, you have to say that the uncertainty falls out, you know, it's, it's kind of like your result falls too far into the uncertainty. And so it's not a result. Well, it, where you end up having to deal with this the most is is that issue of star galaxy separation. Uh, if you're trying to figure out these faint little things that I'm looking at that are basically the same size as a star, you have to figure out how much am I interested in the galaxies such that I'd rather get more stars in my sample versus how much am I interested in a different science problem so it's more important that I miss galaxies and only have galaxies. So, so you have to make choices as you go. Um, when you're dealing with photometry, when you're just trying to figure out how much light is coming off the subject, uh, you quite often end up having to run through a variety of different, I'm going to try, one of the things that we look at is what's called full width half max. This is where you do a curve of how much light is coming off of an object and, and you plot the from the center outwards, how much light am I getting? And there's a certain cutoff where at that width of, of that plot of from the center outwards, how much light do I get? You're getting half of the light within that particular annulus. 
you try different multiples of that, trying to figure out what is the best solution for the sky conditions you're dealing with on a given night. It's it's complicated, and there's in, entire basically observing books dedicated to the simple problems of trying to figure out very precisely how bright is this thing that I'm trying to measure. And Right. If you study variable stars, it's important for you to be able to know if the star is varying in brightness. Or, or if, if you're trying to, to study many other things, so you can look at the flickerings of a quasar in the distance. Um, if you're looking at certain types of objects that are basically standard candles, so supernovae, it becomes very important. There's lots of times when it's very important to know precisely how bright what you're looking at is. Right, I can just imagine the standard candle with a supernova, that's a, that's a great point, right? Because you could be off by, by hundreds of millions of light years <laughs> if, you get, if you get that wrong. And so, for example, results like discovering dark energy depended on, on them getting the brightness of those, of those type 1a supernova perfectly. And so if you get that wrong, then you may not detect dark energy and things like that. And, so, and, dark, and dark energy is another one of those cases where the point spread function became very important because they were looking at the variations in the shape in the average shape of galaxies at the edge of what was easy to see, which means you have to know what distortions are due to dark matter, not dark energy, sorry, dark matter is another one of those things where it's very important to understand your point spread function because trying to understand the microlensing and all the other lensing effects that come in due to that dark matter requires you to know very precisely my point spread function is causing this distortion and dark matter is creating this other distortion. Right, and you can only be certain about the part that is outside of the of the point spread part. So, yes. um, okay, so so what what are there some tricks that astronomers can use? I'm guessing build a bigger telescope. Bigger, big, build the bigger telescope is is definitely one one situation. Um, there, there's also the combine multiple telescopes so that you have a greater edge to edge distance. This is something the very large telescope does in the infrared. It's something that Alma does in the microwave and the radio. Um, interferometry is kind of the ultimate. Get a greater distance left right forward, backwards, north, south, east, west, pick an axis. Um, and so specifically, right, the baseline of your telescope is what you're, is what you're fighting with on this. For resolution, not for how faint or what you're looking at. Right, for faintness, right. you want bigger. Yeah. But for resolution, it's, it's you need how many wavelengths fits from one edge to the other edge. And the more wavelengths you can fit, the higher the resolution of your telescope. And we do play some digital games. There's this evil thing called an unsharp mask, which is the reason that many of the pre-Pluto encounter images of Pluto make Pluto look like it's lumpy when it's probably a real sphere. Right. Now, what about time? Because uh, like I know with a lot of amateur astrophotographers, when they take images of, of Jupiter and such, for example, instead of just taking a photograph, they will record a video and then they'll stack up all the frames of the video where bits and pieces of it are clear and it creates a very stunningly clear image that looks a lot better than what you get with just one, one frame from the telescope. And I know that NASA actually has, has developed technology that's sort of similar for that, that, that they can instead of looking at a photograph, they actually can enhance, zoom in it's, and enhance. It's called drizzle. Um, so, yeah. so the idea is that if you take just one image, all the, the pixels are going to be distorted due to the light getting shifted over time as it comes through. So uh, to, to give you a specific, the light from the red spot might be three pixels by three pixels, but then also wander an additional three pixels in any given direction over time. So that three pixel by three pixel red spot over a five minute image might blur out to a nine pixel by nine pixel smudge. Now, if instead of, of taking that long exposure where the atmosphere is being whimsical, you can instead take a whole bunch of high speed images, you can stack those high speed images and align on the specific features so that you can essentially erase the movement that's put in by the atmosphere. Now with Hubble, you don't have to worry about the atmosphere, which is why we put Hubble in space. But what they've figured out to do 
is if you nudge your telescope, <clears throat> sorry, still getting over this, this throat issue. Uh, sorry, Preston. Um, what, what they've learned with Hubble is if you nudge your telescope around ever so slightly from image to image, you can go from having a feature dead center on a pixel to being half on, half on, off a pixel. And as you move things around, you're shifting what the centers of the pixel are looking at by then drizzling the images together where you add them in this higher resolution space, you can essentially take advantage of that change in what's at the center of the pixel to get a higher resolution, sort of. It's a fake. You can fake the higher resolution image in a fairly valid kind of way that we understand. Right, because a half pixel is half as good as a regular pixel, but it's still better than no pixel. Well, it, it's giving you an authentic understanding of what's going on when you're pointed at this one place versus when you're pointed at this other place. So you, you can actually say, yes, the average between these two positions is actually half of that, half of their two values, or, oh no, it's not actually half of their two values. It's, it's actually a third. Um, so it gives you a sense of what is the gradient between two different positions as you move the telescope around. That's pretty cool. So they, it, they'll actually just like, just gently drift the Hubble around a little bit just to try and get moving, shifting the images onto different pixels, and then they'll build it back on computer to, to rebuild it. And and we do this with ground-based images as well, with ground-based and with space-based. You have to worry about things like cosmic rays, hot pixels, uh, variability and sensitivity. And, and so in general, even if you don't have the advantages of drizzle, by moving the image around ever so slightly with where it hits on the CCD, you can take care of some of these blemishes, take care of some of these aberrations. That is that is really cool. So are there any other any other tricks? I mean, you talked about about interferometry. Um, you know, I know that's tougher for visible light telescopes. It, the the wavelengths are just too small to to feasibly add together with current technology on a large scale. There there's some testing units that have gotten it to work, um, but but the real thing we have to be careful of is how we use our our technology. Um, as I said, one of the the things that gets abused is is the idea of an unsharp mask, and this is something that we all have the button in any of the software we use that says sharpen. And when you click that little button that says sharpen, what it's actually doing is mathematically going through and trying to figure out where are there features that are above a certain threshold. So it starts out often by blurring the image out, subtracting off the blur, looking for what's left, and then strengthening the signal from those things that stand out above the blur. This is a great way to get rid of things like JPEG artifacts where it didn't do a good job figuring out how to smooth the color in your background. But if you over apply the sharpen, it starts um, making up data that's not actually there essentially. And this is where we're running into so many problems with Pluto data right now is six weeks out when you unsharp mask, a expanded image where you've taken your three pixels, turned it into 20, and then unsharp mask it a bunch of times, you end up with something deformed with texture. We don't know if Pluto has texture. It's probably not deformed. Um, this is all artifacts of hitting that sharpen button many too many times. And so, you know, we talked about build a bigger telescope, but I guess with New Horizons, the solution is get closer. That works too. We, we've all done that with our camera. You can only zoom so far before it goes into the software zoom and software zoom bad, don't you software zoom. Um, so you walk closer to your subject. Well, it's you can't walk closer to Pluto, but you sure can fly a uh, little tiny spacecraft there. And, I, and so I guess that's it. Let's launch more spacecraft. Let's build bigger instruments and put more stuff into space to get away from the, uh, the blurring effect of atmosphere. And hey, while we're giving Pluto a shout out, don't forget Ceres. We, we have the Dawn mission that is shrinking its orbit down, getting closer and closer. And Ceres is a former planet too. It was on that classic list of worlds. And uh, the Dawn mission is going to hopefully let us see awesome features like 
geysers and help us figure out what the heck these shiny spots are that, that are cropping up on its surface. So we have multiple missions and Don is going to sure send us back a whole lot more gigabytes than New Horizons is of this other former planet. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thank you. And you thought we'd run out of things to say. No, I just want, I, 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 if <laughs> I need to get my head around the, around the, the concept. And then once I feel like I understand it, <laughs> then I can, then I know that the, uh, the viewers will dig it too. That's cool. all. I have legs, kind of teeth. And for those of you watching live, in 20 minutes, we will start to get more NASA TV coverage of that awesome balloon test drop of uh, a flying saucer. This is the Mars deceleration test, yeah. spacecraft, yeah. Yeah, it's, inter it's a really interesting solution to this problem, right? That, that <clears throat> the Mars atmosphere is, is too thin to allow like a proper deceleration the way we do here on Earth, but it's like too thick to really slow yourself down and land like what they do on the moon. It's and so they need this a solution like this. It's pretty uh it's pretty amazing. So the LDSD uh hashtag is filled with all sorts of awesome today. Um so check it out if you have haven't yet and um it's just cool watching things head towards space to mars um well, or at least the upper atmosphere for today and so just one reminder as well while you're watching this uh the new trailer for the martian is out you should uh go watch it it's really great I, I'm having a, but I liked the book moment, as, as I already told Fraser earlier today. Ridley Scott is, uh, he can only rarely do wrong in my mind, like Prometheus, but uh, apart yeah, from that, that one was great. bad. Yeah, but I saw, I see him growing potatoes. I see math. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so if you haven't read the book, read the book and then, or stick around till November 25th and watch the movie. Um, okay, so Ilad Avron asks, um, uh, why is Pluto's orbit tilted in relation to the other planets? Don't know. P possibly. <laughs> you know, we, we, look, at, we look at exactly Uranus, why. right? And we say, like, why is Uranus possibly completely knocked over? What could it be? Well, with Uranus, it was probably either a um, impact or some sort of a torquing event. But with so many different Kuiper Belt objects, with so many different tilts um you you don't know what was the heating process that essentially knocked so many different things into wild orbits so it could be anything from a three-body interaction with another kuiper belt object to uh, impacts to some kind of outgassing Multiple. outgassing thrust over long periods of time from exactly. interactions with the sun or or maybe a close pass from another star that maybe heated it up. There's a million things that could have happened over 4.5 billion years. Okay. With, with the inner Kuiper belt, it's, it's probably not a star passage, but there's so many things it could be. Uh, Steve Chisnell notes that the Kerbal Space Program is a great game for learning the physics of spaceflight. Agreed. Yes. It um, doesn't have balloon launches yet. Not yet. Uh, they've, they've got a mod that does, um, ion drives. I don't know if they've actually <laughs> put it into the main game yet, Yeah. but that's super cool. Um, so Larry Beckham asks, can you make a CCD that does still, that, that does still, that will not saturate? Can you make a CCD yes. that won't fill up? They, they have those, but the problem is that when it doesn't saturate, you're, it's essentially lying to you. So if you're trying to do 
um, careful photon counting, you absolutely, it's called an anti-bloom CCD. You absolutely don't want to lose. You absolutely do not want to use an anti-bloom CCD when you're, you're trying to count photons because if you get very close to the edge of, of that linear area of your CCD where one additional photon is, is measured as one additional photon, um, if you accidentally sneak out of that region, it's not gonna let you know. A, a CCD that's happy to spill photons all over the place, it's gonna tell you when you screwed up and stepped out of that regime where you should have stayed. Uh, Steve Chisnell asks, uh, isn't another trick for optics with a curved focal plane making or installing custom CCD chips that are matched, curved to match the focal plane curvature? That works for really big fields of view. Uh, for instance, you want to use something like that if you're dealing with a Schmidt system. Um, but if you have a really uh, either a really small focal area where you don't have to worry about curvature, um, a really flat field, it, it all depends on your optics. Different optics have different needs. But but when you have an optic system and you've got the light coming through the the lens, you know we all see it on a flat. I guess because you know we always see projected on something flat, like a piece of paper or our eyeball or I guess whatever. But but I guess that's the question: is like when it's actually coming down, is it ideally projected onto a curved system that somehow matches the the curvature of the of the lens? It, it, it depends entirely on the optical system. Right. So there are some optical systems like Schmidt um, optical systems that end up with a curved focal plane that if you put a flat detector on, you're going to end up with what's called spherical aberration where the outer parts of it, the image focus at a different place than the inner parts of the image. Now with a system like that, if you curve your detector, you're good. Now with other systems, you have a completely flat focal plane, so that's not an issue. Okay, uh, so here's a question that's completely different um, from John Hamilton. And so he asks, how can a black hole be said to be spinning? I know that compact objects speed up when they collapse down, but once the matter collapses behind an event horizon, it's basically cut off from our universe for good, right? Why not a spherical event horizon once formed? Um, so, so the spinning actually defects the shape of the event horizon and changes how things interact at the event horizon. So a spinning black hole has much more evil and complicated mathematics to describing the region of space around it than a non-spinning black hole. And we can see the actual effects of the rotation of the black hole in what's going on with the accretion disk. So there's actually been observations made that confirm that black holes within error bars are spinning. And in fact, some of the largest ones, the supermassive black holes, are spinning at the, at limits the limit predict at the limit predicted by relativity. That yeah. that they are spinning just shy of light speed, which is crazy. And the and so as you said, right, you get this, you get it's almost like it it flattens yeah. out. And this and is where they talk about naked singularities. Is if it flattens out enough, nominally you could see, but we don't get there because that requires speed of light type stuff. Right. And so the 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 light speed, the 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 speed limit of light prevents that that event horizon from flattening out to the point that the singularity is is revealed. And that's it's all it all works. It's amazing. To to go back to LDSD for a moment. Um, if you're not following Alex underscore Parker on Twitter, as we approach New Horizons, you should be following him. He's a planetary scientist, part of the New Horizons team, and he just tweets clever stuff periodically. And earlier today, he tweeted, Earth's atmosphere is basically going, referring to LDSD. Is that a giant pocket of helium here? Get it out of here. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. And, and that's basically what is happening with this balloon is the atmosphere has been tricked into trying to excrete the helium balloon out the top of the atmosphere. Um, I just need to share that image. It's been my favorite thing to see all day. Um, let's see. So uh, ISS above, I guess Liam Kennedy notes uh, that people, when they're seeing UFOs visiting the ISS on the live NASA camera, 
same thing, right? People are uh, are taking still images from NASA TV or NASA NASA images, and then they're <clears throat> expanding them, mucking with them, enhancing and magnifying, and seeing all kinds of crazy stuff in there. And it's not real. Not real. Um. Uh, Adam Synergy uh, posted a link on on Astro PH about the minimum, the way you can get at the minimum, I guess, hell, okay, hold on, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the lower limits on aperture size for an exo-earth detecting coronagraph mission. But the gist is exactly what you said. There is a, essentially, there's a certain point on aperture size where if you get any smaller than that aperture, you're not going to be able to detect an exo-earth. So NASA just deeply amused me. They just tweeted, uh, miss LDSD launch due to uh, WWDC 15. So NASA's acknowledging that many of us were torn between watching NASA TV or the keynote of Worldwide Developers Conference. And so speaking to that need, they posted that uh, you can now watch live the continuing test. So starting in nine minutes, they will be dropping the UFO through the atmosphere. That is awesome. Uh, John Hamilton is proposing an episode on orbital rotational resonances. That might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, resonances. I like it. Okay. Uh, so Elad Ivron asks, how artificially enhanced was that huge image of Andromeda that was released some months ago? So do you remember that picture? It was like a, it was like a, a billion pixel image, I think it was a that, giga. That wasn't actually that enhanced because if you think about it, um, if we could see Andromeda with our eyes in its full size, it would be many, many times the size of the moon. Yeah. It's, it's several degrees across. The moon is half a degree across. Start adding in what you can see in the infrared of the gas that you can't even see in the visible. Andromeda is big, and and so it's easy to get that many pixels of it if you look at it with high enough resolution telescopes. Yeah, totally. The real frustration with Andromeda is the variation in brightness as you go from the outer edge to the very center requires lots of working with logarithms to try and scale everything so you can see the faintest details and not oversaturate the center. All right. Well, I think we should wrap this up. I've got to run and I want to watch this. I want to watch this. Yeah, test. I do too. I'm watching. So, a, I'm guilty of watching on Twitter right now. Everyone yeah, talking yeah. about it. So why don't we, why don't we wrap things up for today? So, uh, we've got a weekly space hangup coming up on Friday. Anything else, uh, happening on your department? I think this is a mostly week off. Uh, next week we will have Astronomy Cast on Monday, Google Lunar X Prize on Tuesday. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's a learning space on Wednesday, either next week or this week. I'm a bad human for not knowing the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to actually switch to having Astronomy Cast on Tuesdays for a couple of weeks because of my travel, just to yep. give everyone a heads up. Yeah, so uh, next week will be Monday, and then after that, it's going to be Tuesdays for two weeks. Yep. Okay. All right, well, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and we will see you all next week.